actually uh, just yeah, tr tr transit the, uh, the director responsibility just uh, this year or last year? Last this year, right? So, uh, so since now Michelle is no longer director, she can enjoy size more than Simon now. <laughs> um, uh, instead of doing a regular introduction, um, I think I would like to uh, do it a little differently since I personally uh, know, know them very well. Um, um, so I was a post I was in Michelle and I still remember the first time when I came to Bruce. Uh, well, go to Bruce, went to Bruce, and uh, uh, Michelle and Simon are very, very nice, and they offered to uh, pick me up in the airport. But instead of handing me a, uh, a book of materials related to what I'm going to be involved in, in terms of size, they uh, gave me a bottle of wine as the gift. Um, so that's the first thing I learned in French that uh, wine always goes first and then size. <laughs> and I believe that in the next two talks, they will prove to you that the more wine you drink, the better science you can do. <laughs> so, um, the next talk will be started with Michelle, and her talk is going to be categorization of objects in nature scene. The first 200 milliseconds of video process. Please join me for the talk. I would like to do is to thank all the organizers and all the people that participate in the organization of this meeting because it's really great. It's a real experience and uh, we are really well looked after. So thank you very much for this uh, organization. Um, now I would like to attract your attention to a few things in the title. The first 200 milliseconds of visual processing. I don't want to talk about any kind of time consuming processes, just what kind of cognitive tasks you can do with less than 200 milliseconds of visual processing. And the second thing is that I will, go, I will talk about real objects. We have heard a lot about simple objects. I will talk about real objects in real photographs of natural scenes. And which something which is not in the title, I will sometimes throw a few results about monkey behavior because we know a lot about neurophysiology in monkey and it can help a lot to interpret our results. Okay, so uh, I will show you a little film just to show why I'm interested in very rapid processing. Um, and I'm sure you will know what the common object to all the scenes you will see. So although you can probably not remember this scene, you'll probably notice that there is an animal in every one of them. And you have been able to process all these scenes very, very, very rapidly. Okay, so to look at uh, this uh, type of processing, we use the, a fast visual categorization task that Simon set up in 1996. And uh, basically the subject are facing the screen and some natural um, photographs are flashed for only 20 milliseconds in the center of the screen. And the subject has to release a button if they see an animal or another category of object, but let us talk about animal now. And uh, they have to keep pressing the button uh, if they don't see any animal. So it's a go, no go response, okay? This is the kind of uh, uh, image that uh, can be flashed. All right, this is what you have seen. Uh, basically, humans are really good at doing such tasks. They score about 94% correct, whatever the set of uh, stimuli you give. And, uh, they have a, a reaction time distribution, and you will see quite a lot of them. So in green, you have the uh, reaction time distribution of correct co-responses, and in red, the false alarm. And something which is very much of interest for us is the first time being at which you can see a statistical bias towards correct co-responses, because we think this is the minimal time in which the processes can be completed. Uh, this is distribution uh, of reaction time. You can also look at the EEG while the subjects are performing the task. And uh, you can average the ERPs on correct target trial in green and on correct distracted trial in red. You can see that they superimpose very well. And uh, there is an abrupt difference that starts at about 150 milliseconds here and that is shown in blue, uh, which is the difference between these two average ERPs. 
Okay, so maybe animals are a bit special, they are biologically pertinent, but we can change the target. Here, uh, you had the animals in uh, non-target uh, trials, but you can change and have vehicle as target among non-vehicle uh, distractors. If you look at the reaction time, you get about uh, the same distribution of reaction time for vehicles and for animals. So you can have the same uh, sort of uh, fast reaction, fast uh, response for vehicles. You can also have it for human beings. And if you try to get some uh, objects, category of objects that are supposed to be processed faster, like human faces, you get the same results. And uh, animal faces, you get the same results. So basically, this is the best you can do. It's optimal. But you have an easy switch between categories, which shows a behavioral flexibility. A, a result from monkeys. Monkeys can do the task as well. They are much faster than humans. This is the uh, distribution of reaction time for monkeys. They are not that less accurate, 90% correct, with seeing they see only for the first time. So don't compete with monkey. <laughs> Is the, is the neat answer. Something which is very interesting is that this minimal reaction time I was talking uh, about earlier is at 180 milliseconds in monkeys. And this is a real challenge to be able to explain that monkeys can let go of a button in 180 milliseconds. This is a picture that uh, we published in 2001. And uh, here is a ventral stream with uh, the various steps into the ventral stream that looks after object recognition. The first figure is the shortest latency that has been seen in this area, and the second figure is a, an average latency for this step, average step. Okay, what happens if you look at uh, the, the trajectory that has been, well, has to be done through the visual system and then the motor system to explain that the monkey can let go of a button in 180 milliseconds, it's very difficult to, to uh, uh, escape the conclusion that the, uh, the processing that has to be done is largely feed forward, and I think Simon will talk a lot about that, massively parallel, and I'm going to talk about it, automatic, which also I'm going to talk about, and based on course representations. Okay, so how parallel and how automatic are the things I would like to discuss with you today. When you try to find an animal in a natural scene, a natural scene is something coherent. Um, so what happens if you have now to tell the same thing, let go of a button if you see an animal, but you have two scenes to process in the same, in the same time. So we set up a task in which you could have one scene on one side, one scene on the other side, or two scenes together. This is what it looks like, so you can do the task and you can clap it in your hand every time you see an animal. Good. Now with one image, this is what you score. You know it's a reaction time distribution for correct and uh, false alarm. Uh, you have a, an accuracy which is a bit lower because now the images are on the, in, the, in the periphery of your fovea, okay? But uh, this is what you get with two images. So basically there is no cost, at least no temporal cost. And the decrease in accuracy here can be explained perfectly well with a model that takes into account the performance on a one image trial. So this is in uh, pink, the performance of the subject D prime, the dynamic D prime, um, for one image trial, and in blue for two image trials, and in green the model that has been built from the performance on the one image trial. So you have one image on each side. As they are briefly flashed, they are, um, they are 
present by uh, one is fair, and you have uh, a sort of uh, conflict I will talk about at the front of cortex in order to decide which response we are going to give. Okay. Differential activity in terms of uh, EEG. Can I remember, uh, can I remind you, we do the uh, difference between uh, target and distracted trials. This is what you get on the occipital side for one image trial. This is what you get for two image trials. So it's exactly the same uh, differential activity. On the other hand, if you look at frontal sites, then you, uh, you get a lower amplitude for the two image trial. Because basically, uh, we have one hemisphere saying, no, there is no uh, animal. And the other saying, oh yes, there is an animal. Unfortunately, we didn't have any trial with two animals in one. So that's it. OK. The performance drops with four images. I've got the only one trial. So you will have to be asked whether there were an animal or not, and whether you could actually recognize some other pictures that I'm going to flash. I'm going to flash four images. Are you ready? Where's the animal? <laughs> yes? Do you know what kind of animal it was? Camel. Camel. Okay. Any, any other images that you have seen? Flowers, yes? Very good. Here is what you showed. Okay? <laughs> Not exactly camels, but it's a mammal. It's a mammal. You are not in the best condition, I must say, but you had you had two pictures right. Okay, so basically, uh, the performance really dropped with uh, four images. Um, on the one image trial, you, you score only eighty percent correct. Okay, on the two image trial you score 75% correct. And the very interesting thing is that whether the two images are flashed <coughs> on one side, so processed by the same hemisphere, or the two hemispheres, so that they are processed by two hemispheres, you get exactly the same uh, results. So the parallelism is the same within an hemisphere or between the two hemispheres. For image, obviously you get a, a reduced um, um, accuracy. It's almost explained by the same model, but I will say that here we are at the limit of the parallelism in the visual system. Okay, um, the uh, um, distribution of reaction time with one image, with two images, no cost, except of course the cost in accuracy, and with four images, uh, no cost as far as the reaction time is concerned. Again here, just to show that uh, when the two images are flashed on one hemisphere, uh, so processed by the same hemisphere or processed by two hemispheres, you get very similar response time distributions. Okay? And about, about differential activity, remember we had uh, no uh, no difference in the occipital part, but we had a conflict on the frontal part. So this is what you get with two images. It's about very similar to what uh, I showed you previously. But with four images, you definitely get uh, a difference here. So basically, we are at the limit of the parallelism. OK. What you can conclude from that first experiment is that you don't need focused attention to process an object in a natural scene. And this was shown also the same year by, maybe, by another group. Um, Fei Fei Li, Rufin Van Bullen, Christoph Koch, and Pietro Perona using a, a dual path paradigm. And I'm going to show you this dual path paradigm because I'm going to use it a bit uh, further. Uh, in the talk. So, what happened in that paradigm? You are asked to focus on the fixation cross and you have a demanding attentional task to perform in the center. This task is adjusted for every subject so that you get only 75 to 80% correct. Okay? 
Then you have a second task to perform. A uh, natural photograph can appear in each of the four quadrants. And then again, it's adjusted for every subject to be performed about 80% correct on its own. Now, this is what it looks like. So try to find an L among T or a T among L. It's masked. And uh, in that case, you are not looking for an animal. You are trying to tell me if the, visit, if the face is a male or a female. Okay? Um, you need to be trained, but you can perform that. It's pretty difficult. And the uh, central task has to be processed as a priority. So here is a way you are actually presenting the results in such a task. You normalize the central performance at 100% when you are asked to perform the central task on its own. You normalize the peripheral performance at 100% when you are asked to perform the peripheral task on its own. The interesting thing is what happens to the peripheral performance when you do the two tasks in the same time. As you have to give priority on the central task, your results should be here. Okay? And the best way to look at what happened is first to throw a task which you know is attentional demanding, like is this disk red on the left side or on the right side? And what happened to the performance of such a task is that it falls to chance level. Good. Now, what happens if you have to tell animal among non animal? Well, you are very good you are almost at 100% correct. What happens if now you are looking at a vehicle among non-vehicle? You are not bad. So basically when you do that, at the periphery, in the quadrant, with a central task which is very attentional demanding, you can do such a task. No attention required for animal or for man-made object. So the first conclusion I want to make is that visual um, processing in such categorization tasks is largely parallel and uh, doesn't need attention whether you are trying to find a biologically pertinent object or whether you are trying to find a man-made object. Okay, categorization can be done at multiple levels. So far, this picture can be seen as an animal, as a dog, as a collie, as my dog. Also, it's not my dog. Anyway, uh, and uh, in all the psychological textbook, you know since uh, Roche et al. said in work that you have a basic level advantage. Normally, what is said is that this picture is first recognized as a dog before needing more abstraction to be recognized as an animal and more details to be recognized as a coin. But remember, it was already very, very challenging to find out how the monkey could actually let go of the button in 180 milliseconds when he was doing superordinate categorization. Could it be even faster at the basic level? We had quite a bet at that time. Um, and there is a large controversy actually since two, two, uh, no, 2005 with the uh, paper from Louis Spector and Ken Wisher who claim that as soon as you know it is there, you know what it is at the basic level. And two other paper uh, published uh, a few years later saying, no, no, it's easy to detect an object, it's easier than categorizing it. Okay, back to our task then, back to our fast categorization task. What happens if I take, for example, a picture of birds and I ask subject to uh, categorize them as animal among non-animal distractors or as birds among distractors that are non-animal or that are non-bird animals. We got over 600 uh, pictures as varied as we can have. And uh, we looked first at the results at the superordinate level. Well, you know pretty well now this uh, re reaction time distribution. Uh, we can see here that if anything, birds, birds picture recognized as animal are 
a bit easier than the other known bird pictures. But the real question is what's going to happen when the same images have to be categorized at the basic level? And the answer is it takes much longer. It takes over 50 milliseconds longer to actually categorize them at the basic level. And if you look at the false alarm here, 90% of them are performed towards animals. Looks like you had to go first to animal to go to uh, bird uh, representation. Same thing in monkeys, I'm not showing it to you, but there is a 20 millisecond shift in monkeys that uh, were trained to alternate between superordinate and basic categorization. And birds are not special. If you do the same thing with dog, well, you get the same 40 millisecond shift towards longer latencies. So basically, you know it's an animal before you know it's a dog, or before you know it's a bird. But um, <coughs> process data on the basic level advantage are well established, and they have been replicated a certain amount of time. So how can we explain the result discrepancy like that here? Is it an artifact of brief stimulus presentation that has been suggested in the literature that our results were just um, an artifact? Because as we flashed the pictures, uh, we sort of uh, um, favor the superordinate categorization. So back to our fast categorization task using uh, 25 millisecond briefly flashed pictures or 250 millisecond a presentation of 500 millisecond presentation. What you can see here is an increasing reaction time from superordinate to basic and basic to subordinate and a decreasing accuracy. What happened for long time presentation, exactly the same thing. So this is not an artifact of brief presentation. Does it stand for something else than animal? For example, vehicles? Um, the answer is uh, less obvious, but you still have an increased reaction time from vehicle to car and from car to uh, subordinate category. What we never replicated using, I re just note that, using visual presentation and motor response. We never have any verbal responses. We never use words. We use speeches and motor response we never reproduce any basic level advantage. Okay, so fast categorization seen with superordinate category, but more time is needed for basic and subordinate. What is the additional processing time for? We need actually attention, focused attention, to be able to process an image at the basic level. Back to the uh, dual task. This is why I was explaining you in detail this dual task. And uh, this time, we are going to present in periphery a uh, natural picture and ask the subject to categorize that picture as an animal, as a, sorry, as a bird or as a dog among other animals. So remember, we had vehicle among uh, non-vehicles in blue here animal against non-animal in red here. What happens now if the subjects are asked to categorize cars among non-vehicles and dogs among other animals? And the answer might be very surprising, but you are extremely good. What does that mean? That means that by default, object categories are processed up to the basic level, at least. I, I didn't try the subordinate level. But that's another implication. It's when two objects are processed in close succession, then the processing of the second object should be perturbed by the representation that is active from the first object. Because if you look at neurophysiology, then the uh, selective population of neurons have a sustained response even when the object has disappeared. So let us try another task, a priming task. First stimulus flash for 20 milliseconds, but just ignore it. Okay? This is what the subject are told. Short SOA or longer SOA, and then a second stimulus. And this time, 
you have to process it up to the basic level. Okay? This is just a priming, priming task, but it is very surprising that this kind of priming task has been done several, well, I can't say, thousands of times, I will say, uh, using words and pictures, but very, very seldom using two pictures in a row. Okay. Bird. Let us say you activate by default a bird representation. Bird. You reactivate the same representation. So it's a sort of a congruent situation where actually it's easy to answer bird. Let us say the first stimulus is a plane. Then you have a conflict to solve between a plane and a bird. What happens if it's a dog? Well, a dog is not a bird. It's an animal, but it's not a bird. So you have also a conflict to solve here. So what's happening in terms of performance? This is in green. What happens with when birds are primed by birds? You have a certain uh, level of reaction time and a certain level of error rate. When the bird is primed by a non-bird or a non-bird animal, then you have an increase in reaction time which is much stronger and we also have an increase in error rate, at least in our experiment, quite big actually. But the interesting question is not whether congruent versus incongruent situation should produce that effect. My question is, what is the most, uh, the, the representation, representation that is going to interfere most with the bird representation? What's your guess? Is it going to be the plane or the dog? Aha. Get your own guess. You will see who is right. Um, okay, let us have the baseline. The baseline is bird prime by bird. And this is what you get when the bird is primed by a plane. You get a certain amount of reaction time increase and a very small error rate, actually. Um, and you can see that at both SOA, short SOA and long SOA, you have the same problems, the same interference. What happens now if the bird is primed with a dog? Not very much at short SOA, except that you have a larger error rate. But at long SOA, then that's really a very big effect in the sense that you have a strong increase in reaction time, almost 50 milliseconds, and a large increase in error rate. So the conclusion is that the interference is stronger when objects are more similar. And in that uh, experiment, it means that when they belong to the same superordinate category. How can we explain that? Well, you know from uh, uh, a lot of MRI studies that in the ventral stream, you have regions that are activated by inanimate objects and regions that are activated by animate objects. If your bird picture is prime with a plane, you can easily make the distinction at that level, animate versus inanimate. But by default, as I showed you, uh, the image is processed at least up to the basic level. So you know, although you don't want to know it, you know it's a plane, and you know that it's a bird. Now, if you are processing a dog and then a bird, you have to get to this level to be actually able to solve uh, the uh, interference. And both uh, birds and dogs have animal features, and they all have animal features. OK, so that's my third conclusion. Basic categorization is an automatic process even when subjects are instructed to ignore the stimulus. And even, uh, I haven't shown that to you, but believe me, even for object characteristics, that are not task related. When objects are presented in close succession, their perceptual representations interfere. And interference is stronger when objects are more similar here when they belong to the same superordinate category. So, how can we explain the discrepancy between our results and uh, Roche's results? I think one of the main reasons for me is the fact that uh, we are using block, um, block stimulus presentation. And she is using uh, a different category at every trial. 
So the interference between the object representation is much stronger in her parts than in ours. And the second thing that we can't ignore is the fact that in language, uh, we have uh, the basic words like dog and cars used much more than animals and vehicles. So that could explain also the discrepancy. Still, question marks. We'll see. Uh, <clears throat> so we need additional processing time to go from basic category, uh, to go from superordinate category to basic. So we are back to the cost to, sorry, to the cost to find type of processing. One, one uh, problem that we have to solve is uh, maybe the core step, the superordinate core step that we see as very, very uh, uh, fast uh, categorization task might be an artifact of global image statistics. This was suggested by uh, the group of Toralba and Oliva in 2003, saying every, every natural image has a very uh, specific spectral signature. So you know when you are in front of a natural scene, you know when you are in front of an artificial scene, you know when you are in front of an artifactual object, or when you are in front of a natural object. And moreover, that was not nice for us, they showed that using their, their model, they could actually do very well the animal, non-animal task. So maybe global statistic was enough. They didn't, our subjects were not processing at all the object. They were just doing global statistics analysis. So what did we do? We took two contexts, gray scale pictures so that uh, we had no bias with colors. Two objects, uh, I'll let you with the uh, same elements, same contrast, same pixel surface, same size in real life, same position in the image, etc., etc. And you make four uh, images. And you do quite a lot of that. It's very time consuming, ask my students. There are up now to 500 set of four images like that. Okay? The nice thing when you do the spectral signature of these images is that if subjects are relying on global statistics, they should say animal to these two kinds of image category. If they use the object, they should say animal to these two uh, images that have very different spectral signatures. Your guess? This is the model of um, Toralba and Oliva on uh, normal pictures, 84, 85%. Our subject actually scored 94%. What happened on our set of four images? Well, the model is at random. So that's nice, the model can't do it. But we can do it. And so monkey can do it as well. So subjects rely on objects. They just not rely on global statistics. But they might rely a little bit on global statistics. Why do I say that? It's because when you look at these four pictures, you can say these ones are much more congruent, I would say, than these ones. So you should find the difference between congruent and incongruent pictures. And you find it in green, the congruent pictures, in blue, the incongruent pictures, and the reaction time distribution here, and the D prime, dynamic D prime here, it's easier to see here. You can see that when you process an incongruent association between the object and the context, your latency of your response latency shifted towards longer latency, and uh, you get an impact also on your accuracy. Um, monkeys have the same effect. They also are sensitive to the contextual effect. And this contextual effect is much more increased with age. If you are young, here, most people in the room. If you are old like me, or very old like people that we tested over 80, you can see that the increase that is uh, going on between the congruent and incongruency is much more amplified with age, and the decrease in accuracy is also very much amplified. Also, the performance on the congruent scene is almost similar. Okay, so fast categorization cannot be explained by fast extraction of global image statistics. 
interference between object and context processing flows support massive parallelism and automaticity. But there is one question. How can monkey perceive incongruence? I mean, basically, the only thing they know about is uh, thousands of pictures they have been trained with. And for, to explain that, I think I would like to talk about implicit learning. The implicit learning that uh, Chun and Young have shown in uh, visual search panel where they were using a visual search uh, task like this one, you have to find the chi among L, but sometimes they had displays like this one that were repeated. And when the, when the display was repeated, the target was always in the same place. You can see in red that with repeated display, the reaction time of the subject to find the target was progressively going down. But subjects were not able to tell that this display was more familiar than others. So it was implicit learning and not explicit learning. And if I look at all the images that my monkeys have been processing since they were included in the tasks, where animals are in natural settings and non-animals are in non-natural settings. So this is definitely an association which is strong. And how can I, how can I actually use this uh, um, interaction of, uh, between object and context processing flow in a feedforward interpretation of the processing? This is what I would say. I would say in the ventral stream, we have population of selective neurons for objects. We all know that. But the fact that we see a lot more cows into fields than the cows in offices will certainly co-activate this, this population of selective neurons much more than these ones. And interference would be exactly the contrary when these selective population are not going to be co-activated in daily life. And basically, the experience that we have with such objects in such contextual setting will modulate the strength of connection between this selective population of neurons. So if you see a car, you are much more likely to activate a field than an office. Okay, so I would like to thank all my collaborators. Simon will uh, go on with modeling, I hope. Um, Guillaume Rousselet, who has done a lot about parallelism. Um, Marc Massé and Olivier Joubert and Seb, who has done a lot about, uh, no, sorry, Marc Massé has done a lot with uh, super, superordinate and basic category. Uh, Olivier and Seb with um, uh, contextual association with objects, Maxime and Denis with the uh, monkey works, and Leila and Marlene with the duration of uh, presentation and the clash of category. Thank you very much. start with uh, bird experts and, uh, and dog experts. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't go further uh, since our bird expert didn't show any more effect than the one that are known in the literature. Uh, they are much better at the subordinate level. But they didn't, know, they, they didn't show any sign of difference between the superordinate and the basic level. They show the well-known effect of the subordinate between much, much better than the uh, than uh, other people, which is normal knowing their expertise. As far as different preparation work is concerned, we have done that. We have done the superordinate level in, in um, youngsters, not very small because we didn't get the uh, ethical evaluation. <laughs> and um, so they are quite good as well, no, not much difference. Uh, the um, EG is much more ample, but that's known. Um, and the developmental study we have done is uh, for the contextual effect and the youngster were students and so it means uh, 18 to 22 years of age. Uh, there again we are seeking for ethical authorization to do the same task in schools. It has been refused because it's not pedagogic enough. 
so starting again to get this uh, ethical approval.
this is a too, too long story, so I'm not going to tell about that. Um, however, in the, in, the, in the paper we published with uh, Guillaume Rousselet on faces, we had in our set of faces, uh, Caucasian faces and other uh, race, and we, we, also it's not in our paper, we did all the analysis when we separated uh, Caucasian faces from the others and we couldn't find any difference in that task. For face detection, yes, for face detection, not, not for analysis of, uh, of a given person. It's a very different thing to recognize a face as belonging to a person and just to recognize a face as a face. Actually, in our task, when you process faces, inverted faces, you get exactly the same uh, uh, reaction time distribution. You can't see the inverted effect at that level. You can see it on the EG. Other questions? Sorry, sorry. Hello, Hashim. Um, although you would like to see this as a possible process of um, perception of objects, uh, is it possible mm -hmm. really that subjects were making decisions based on the recognition of features? Mm -hmm. So I don't have to recognize animal, entire animal, but if I recognize a part of animal, it will be sufficient for me to make a decision that this is an animal. Right? So how about is, object um, perception and facial perception? I, I would agree completely. We haven't solved that problem. I've got only two answers on that. Uh, yes, it might be that uh, um, some set of uh, features would be enough. The only thing uh, we have uh, done to uh, avoid the fact that it would be too easy is that in our distractors, humans were not considered as animal. And we had legs, and we have eyes, and we have faces. And people were not slowed down when we throw human beings in our distractors. Monkeys actually said that we were animals. <laughs> so they were not disturbed at all. They just said animals. But uh, human beings said non animals. <laughs> and we have a few features in common. But that doesn't exclude your explanation. I would completely agree that we don't need to go up to the level of the recognition of the object itself and we can base our answer on uh, features at the four level. We are teaching undergrad courses and I teach perception before. I always taught a student like some of the amazing findings are yours, uh, also including the recent um, textbooks. Um, what's the analogy of, say, uh, in, in the classic cognitive science textbook, we're told about um, <coughs> spurtings, um, you know, like very short-term memories decay very fast. How to make the analogy of your recent uh, findings in this very short period of uh, amazing abilities people behave? in this context of um, perception? Um, I, I, I do believe that even if there are flash for 20 milliseconds, you can have memory traces for the images. Is that, am I answering your question in saying that? Because uh, there is all the work from Christian Kaiser showing that uh, even with 6.5 milliseconds, uh, was he using, so he was using, he published with 14 milliseconds, but he, he's happily talking about 7 milliseconds in conferences. Uh, you can have, uh, you can have uh, sustained activity in your normal population. This is, uh, uh, this is the first uh, answer. But uh, with 20 millisecond presentation, you can have a memory trace that is built, especially if you repeat the stimulus. So there is, there is a paper of mine that uh, has, uh, where people were actually uh, um, performing the animal, non-animal categorization task for images repeatedly for three weeks and they had a very good memory about uh, the image that were flashed like that. Never a skin escape here. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been seeking uh, crosswalk. First of all, I wasn't sure whether you ever had the conditions where you had two targets at the same time. Uh, 
it would have been a very nice thing, yes, I agree. No, I, we didn't have that condition. You have to think about the parallelism in between uh, the objects, but also in between the scenes. And uh, I don't know if you have seen the, uh, the different uh, stimuli that we had in the little uh, uh, trial that I showed, but the scenes can be at different um, view um, distance. So you have to process in the same time very close views from very far views. Uh, so I would not know how to ask the question. Maybe you, you would pose the question much better than I would. Because you have to think about the parallelism within an image and in between two images that have nothing in common very, uh, very often, um, not even the distance with which the, uh, the view was taken. So it's a bit difficult to ask the question. Maybe we could start by using two isolated objects, but we haven't done that. I think we can do it, but uh, part of the reasonable thing we're here is to investigate these kinds of uh, issues together and I think also we're going to looking up some special mini workshops for people with different backgrounds to try to address some of these issues. That's right. Thank you. Two frames a second, and you really get the impression 
if you know the stimulus, you know that you, you've got it. I mean, your visual system has done the whole thing. Uh, that last one, um, does the, everybody know what that is? I mean, this is that, you know, that's that Dalmatian picture from Site 101, which you know, many lecturers will give, will give you. This is really interesting, I think, because you know, even 10 seconds during a, during a lecture, you know, I've, I've found plenty of people who haven't done psychology like 15 years, and you flash that up, and they'll say, oh, it's that Site like uh, 101 picture. They stored in a few seconds, if, they, if, if, they, if, they, if you get the, the students interested, they will store this and it's in their brains. And uh, somehow uh, the, brain, the brain has stored a sort of engram of that image. So, so the sort of question I'm interested in, well, how do we do this recognition uh, so efficiently? And also, you know, can we can we imagine building a machine that can do this? Uh, I used to think it was totally impossible, but you'll see that actually uh, we're getting there. Um, and the other interesting thing is how do we learn to recognize new stimuli? How do we do this 10 seconds of looking at a Dalmatian picture? Oh, everybody knows this is Dalmatian. <laughs> okay. um, how, you know, what, what's happening when you do that? So um, I'd like to go back even pre 1996. Uh, I, I was, I've been worrying about how the temporal constraints on, on, on processing uh, constrain models. Um, uh, this is a, an old paper that I did, uh, which is actually based on the fact that I was in Edmund Rolls's lab when I was doing my thesis. And this is Dave Perrett's paper from 1982. This is, these are neurons in the top end of the visual system that are responding selectively to faces, and they do this at 100 milliseconds after the stimulus come, came on. And so I was just thinking about this. This was the time when parallel distributed processing models were coming in. And I said, well, we know, we know that these neurons here are at the top end of a whole series of uh, processing stages going through going from the retina through LGN, B1, B2, B4, ID. That's about the shortest way uh, route you can get there. And it struck me that, um, you know, I made the, the uh, so this is back in 1989, that you know, uh, given that you've got about 10 processing layers, um, you have to be able to do this pretty much in a single uh, feed forward pass. Why? Because any of these loops would probably take like at least 10 milliseconds to kick in. So when you're getting these, these fast um, processing, you probably don't get to uh, get, get the loops to work. And though there are you know, lots of anatomical loops in the system. Also so they said that probably since you have to go through 100 milliseconds in 10, uh, 10, uh, 10 layers in, in 100 milliseconds, that's 10 milliseconds per processing stage. A typical neuron, even if it's firing fast, will generate one spike in that time. So you can't even measure firing rates accurately. It has to be done with a really, really crude processing. So you can't use firing rates. can't really use loops and so on. But this was, this was all based on you know, hand waving, you know, back of an envelope calculations. We didn't really have any type evidence that, you know, real vision as opposed to face selective neurons in, in monkeys could be done like this. But of course, um, with, uh, as Michelle was saying, with, with this sort of experiment, where you have un unpredictable stimuli and you're doing, you know, is there an animal present? And we got, you know, these sort of reaction time distribution and so on. 150 milliseconds was clearly enough to do the whole lot in humans. And, and as Michelle said, humans are actually slow compared with monkeys. So the monkey data really, really puts very severe constraint. And, and, you know, and you've already seen this. But basically, you can, you can go through, sweep through all this lot in, in 100 milliseconds in a monkey and get to the top end of the visual system. Um, you know, it really does look like a, a feed forward, forward processing uh, a sweep with only a few milliseconds per processing step because actually a lot of this time is is not processing it's just getting spikes from A to B the neurons that send information from V1 to V2 to V4 and so on they've got conduction velocities of about one, one or two meters per second so going, going from here to here is going to take a hundred milliseconds just in conduction delays so this is, uh, you know, really sort of tightens things down a, a, a lot. You've probably only got one spike per neuron. Very sparse coding. Very few neurons will actually get to fire during that wave of spike, I would argue. And probably without much help from context, uh, because, you know, if you can, if you can, um, you know, even if 
you don't know what you're looking for. You know, and I flash up the Mona Lisa, and, it's a, and, and you can activate neurons at the top end of the visual system. And Michelle mentioned uh, Christian Kayser's experiment where they have RSVP and look at little blips in the activity of neurons in IT. They can, they can cope with you know, up to 70 frames a second and still, and, and still get close. Um, and here's an interesting question. What's the state of the art in computer vision? I mean, until a few years ago, I said, you know, human vision, there's no way we're going to ever get there. But the fact is that, that computer hardware is getting more and more powerful. So, I mean, if we take the brain, here we've got a, a simulation of 16 million neurons here. Uh, in the brain, there are actually 86 billion neurons, uh, 16 billion of them are in the cortex. Let's say about 4 billion of them in, are in the visual system. And you know they've got this clock that uh, you know the uh, a neuron can't literally physically can't fire more than a thousand spikes per second, and it almost never does more than a hundred or so. Or so. Uh, and, and there's this killer problem here: the, the slow conduction velocity. Is unless you're in the pyramidal tract, uh, you know where they're really big myelinated fibers. Most of the fibers that you're doing vision with are really quite slow. But of course, the brain's great because it doesn't use very much power. Uh, Let's compare that with you know, state-of-the-art computers. Well, if you go out and buy a graphics board, you get 4.5 teraflops. That's a million, million floating point operations a second. Thousands of cores, billions of transistors, lots of memory bandwidth, 200 watts. It gets rather hot. But the other thing is they're cheap. <laughs> uh, so the question is, you know, what can we do with this relative to the human brain? Well, as I say, I, I, I thought, no, no way. But the ImageNet challenge is the sort of the, the, uh, the really hard task for computer vision people. They give you 10 million training images with, with thousands of labels. And you train up your system, and you come and, and then they give you, uh, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of new images, and you have to label them. And, and, they, and they, they score you on how good your labels are. So, you know, this is a bit like our experiment, you know, you flash up an image and you have to make, say, say something sense. Well, I was at the European Conference on Computer Vision in, in Forensi in 2012, where everybody was talking about this competition, because it, uh, it, it, it had been won by a feed-forward convolutional neural network basically nothing very surprising to neurophysiologists. It's, uh, it's uh, trained with uh, the back propagation learning rule, which is not, not very um, biological, to put it mildly. But basically, the system, in the end, is really, really dumb. So it's, uh, it's called supervision. Uh, Jeff Hinton and his two students uh, did this work. And here's the architect. You take an image, and you run through a, a bunch of layers. In fact, uh, so you have a bunch of convolutional la layers, a couple of fully connected layers, and these are the output layer with the, the, with the labels. And they give you all the, here are the numbers, you know, here's the image coming in. It's got, this is sort of D1, it's got, uh, uh, it's 55 by 55 hyper columns, each of which has got 96 different filters. And then you go through a bunch of other things, and, they, uh, and but nobody's done the neurophysiology of what these neurons are doing. But I can show you the first layer, yeah. These are the 96 filters that were learned by the system. And, you know, anybody who's done neurophysiology or, uh, knows that this is what you get in V1, right? I mean, they're just a bunch of your ball patches and oriented filters, some color as well. Um, in the whole system, there are 650,000 neurons. So there are 60 million parameters to train. And the, what's the really hard thing is getting the training done. Um, there are 630 million synapses, okay? But the performance uh, of, uh, of this system, I was, I was, I was truly gobsmacked. This is, uh, this is um, uh, Alex Krzyzewski, the student, just sent me 18, uh, just randomly chosen pictures of animals, uh, and I've ranked them uh, in, in terms of how well the system uh, performed. So for each image, uh, this is a, these images that the system has never seen before. This is the correct answer, the sort of the ground truth. And these are the, the five best labels generated by supervision. And this length of this bar tells you how 
confident it is. So this, this is a sleeve slug and it's like 95% confident in a sleeve slug, but it might be a flat worm, coral weed, sea cucumber or coral. These are all very sensible answers. Brown bear, very confident, actually 100% confident, but it could just about be an otter, a lion, an ice bear or a goat and golden retriever. Jellyfish, all of, these, all of these are all doing fantastically well. Howler monkey, spider monkey, etc. The, the errors are just not, they're not errors, they're just good guesses. Um, even this image, um, you know, which is nothing to do with any, any it, it, it got that it was a mite. Uh, black widow, cockroach, tick, starfish, these are all pretty sensible. Now, it starts getting it wrong here, okay? So, correct answer is spider monkey, and it said it was a howler monkey, spider monkey came in number two. Well, look at these two images, and uh, can anybody here tell me which one is the spider monkey? <laughs> and which one is the howler monkey? It's got this one wrong. It should have said night snake, it said hognose snake. It should have said rough, uh, rough grouse and it said partridge. It came in second with this one. Chimpanzee came in number three. Uh, it thought it was a gorilla. This is a Gordon setter. It, it didn't even get it right at all. It thought it might be a chihuahua. Sorry, I think these are all fairly obscure terms. This picture is terrible, right? You can't even see the head of this. And this is my favourite. The correct answer is cherry. And the stupid system said it was a Dalmatian. <laughs> got it wrong. That's an error. He <laughs> so actually said great elderberry and, and current. <laughs> when I saw this, I thought, wow, the, 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 these guys have, 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 have cornered the market, right? I mean, they know how to do it. Jeff Hinton set up a, co a company with his two students, NDNN Research, and they've been called up by Google. A similar sort of uh, guy, Yan Le Kung, uh, uh, also a... a a pioneer of feed forward convolutional networks from the 80s is now uh, working for Facebook. So you, I, you can expect that within you know, the next few months you're going to be able to take your phone out and, and show it things. It will tell you that it's a chihuahua or a golden sector or whatever. And the, the amount of memory needed to get this to work was, you know, if you remember, it was 60 million parameters. That's 60 megabytes. I, you know, I suspect people are going to be able to do this mobile phone without even being connected with the web. You need quite a lot of processing power to get it to work. But, you know, it's, um, it's quite uncanny. And then when you compare supervision, this is supervision. This is the primate visual system. It's essentially the same thing. It's even got the similar sorts of numbers of layers. And I wrote to Alex Krzyzewski and I said, you, you must have just stolen the, 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 the uh, the, the plan from the primate visual system. No, 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 we just tried various things. This one worked well. In other words, it's convergent evolution. The, the, the guys doing computer vision have ended up with a feed-forward convolutional neural network with no, no loops in it, no horizontal connections, and it's managing to do this really hard stuff, really hard stuff. So you might say, oh, well, problem solved. Let's all go home. Who, who would have got the answer? Well, not quite, because it's using backpropagation, which is, which is uh, very slow, and it actually needs billions of training examples. The only reason why this works today, and it didn't work when Jeff Hinton and Yann LeCun were doing this in the 80s, is they didn't have graphics boards at the time, as far as I can see. Because Alex Krzyzewski, who did, trained up the system, did it all in his bedroom with a, with a computer with two graphics boards because it takes, and this is, this is where I, you know, I just completely fell over, it takes one millisecond to process each image. Well, actually, that's not quite true. It, uh, he loads up, Alex loads up a hundred of these images, and he gets all the answers down in a hundred milliseconds because of the pipeline process. So poor old human visual systems taking a hundred milliseconds, sorry, we've been beaten. This works, this is a hundred times faster. The problem is it's totally unbiological, uh, and, and we don't learn to recognize dogs and cats and, and all the rest of it like this. We don't, nobody shows human children, you know, a, a, a hundred million photos of dogs and a hundred million photos of cats and gives the labels. So um, here's my plea for biology, please. Um, I don't think this is how we learn, but, there, but what I'm going to try and convince you is, is, is that um, 
what's really important to get into a system, a system of two it are spikes. Now, these systems don't use spikes. They're all floating point numbers and convolutions. And spikes give you two things. One is you can you can use a wave of spikes. So rather than you know sending floating point numbers, which is what supervision does, we just sort of send us a wave of spikes to the system. And we use the fact that the most strongly activated neurons fire first, and so we can actually pick off the, the front of the wave and get very efficient processing done that way. Because you can use the order of firing of neurons as a code. And the other thing you get is things like spike time dependent plasticity, which is a learning rule which will change the weights in, in between in connections between neurons depending on the relative timing of input and output spikes. I'll, I'll try and show you how this works. Because I'll, I'll try and show you that uh, these, these two rules together allow neurons to become tuned to things that occur frequently in the environment. And that's, uh, so with no labeling, you can get the system to learn. But a, bit, a little bit about coding with spikes. Um, you know, a neuron is essentially a capacitor with a threshold. So if you've got a weak stimulus, it takes longer to get to the threshold. As you increase the strength of the stimulus, it gets uh, it fires earlier and earlier. So if you flash up an image onto the retina, you're going to activate the wave of spikes where the, the first neurons of the fire actually correspond to the places in the image actually where the contrast is higher. So if you take the optic nerve, it's got a million fibers in it. And you know, the, here are photoreceptors and the ganglion cells. Actually, it's all flipped around the other way around. But the, the, these, these uh, are essentially doing little convolutions. You know, you, so um, you know, take three photoreceptors, feed them into a ganglion cell, and as you increase the local contrast, the neuron will fire uh, more and more quickly. And we've showed that uh, you, know, you, uh, you can actually get remarkably efficient. Um, processing of an image by having multiple scales and, and using on and off center cells, as in the retina, you have a sort of push-pull thing where you're detecting <coughs> bright dots on dark backgrounds and dark dots on, on bright backgrounds. So, you know, here, here, here are neurons uh, getting, going up to the threshold and generating these waves of spikes going up the, the optic nerve. And here we've got a, a, a for a small image, uh, this is this is the number of spikes that we've used, and you can just sort of say, uh, how long do you, you need to recognize who this is with Charlie Chaplin? Well, you don't need very many, because if, you, if, you, if you're reading off spikes in the order of which they're firing, then this is the most efficient way to get the data. So uh, this is one of the keys to why Britain, our visual systems are so efficient, is because we send the information by definition in the order of how important they are, so bright spots come out first. You know, if, if you were lying on your back at night and you open your eyes, the very first ganglion cell in your retina to fire is the brightest star, star in the sky. You've just done a, a massively complicated thing with, what, with one neuron. It's the first neuron to fire. Um, so you, uh, here, here's just to illustrate the, the, the idea. You, you can do this with, the, these are uh, reconstructing images using just a, a, a set of of uh, on and off center receptive um, fields. And we just, every time a neuron fires, you plug in its receptive field in, the imi in, the, in, in this image. Uh, and we're doing it um, in a way where the first neurons to fire uh, 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 were, uh, this is perhaps I can just show you here, um, the, the point at which you realize that this is actually a fox is after when you've only got 0.3% of the cells to fire the spike. This is very efficient. The other idea is learning with spikes. Okay, so spike time dependent plasticity. Uh, I'll try and show you this. This is a way of naturally getting neurons to become selected to things that occur frequently. So this is the basic idea. We have a neuron with uh, synapses coming in. If, the, if one synapse fires systematically before the neuron fires, its weight gets increased, and other ones drop away. Um, the, the standard rule is, is this, the, this is the sort of thing that people tend to use in, in, in modeling. This is the change in the weight of this relative to the, the, the interval between the incoming spike and the outgoing spike. Uh, so um, you depress, if you fire after the neuron fires, you get depressed. If you fire before, you get really enhanced. Actually, we use a really, really dumb rule. It, all synapses get depressed except 
those that would fire it that fired just before the neuron fired. So this is a really reduced complexity learning rule. But it um, has this neat consequence, which is that if you repeatedly activate the neuron with a pattern of spikes, it will concentrate high spike and synaptic weights on the early firing inputs. So here we've got a neuron with 12 inputs. Um, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's give them initial weights of 0.25, and we'll set the threshold for this neuron at, at 3. Um, so in other words, all 12 inputs have to uh, fire to get the neuron over the threshold. And we're going we're gonna, to uh, have a repeating wave of spikes, which would correspond to some pattern in the retina or whatever. Uh, so on the first presentation, here come the spikes. They all have to activate their synapses to go over the threshold, but when they do, uh, but they all get reinforced because they all fired before. Now on presentation two, of the same pattern, maybe we only need nine of them to fire to get over the threshold because we've got bigger spy, uh, synapses now, and so three of them will start dropping away. Um, on presentation three, maybe we only need six now. So six get reinforced, and the other six start dropping away. Presentation four, let's suppose we only need three. And, and, and so within six presentations in all, we cleaned up the, 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 the neurons. So it now has three fully potentiated synapses, and the other nine have dropped away. Now, the neat thing about this is, is we've actually just picked off the first three neurons to fire on the input. And, and it did this in six trials. And if you've got multiple units with different weight sets that you can have inhibiting each other, um, uh, you can actually pick up more complicated patterns. So here we've got four neurons tuned into four different sets of patterns. And so if, those, if that pattern goes through, all four neurons will fire, even if they're embedded in, in, in noise. So you know, you'd have a hard time telling me whether this was interesting or not, but it is actually interesting, that neuron. And you can do this and have a next layer of neuron which pick up those, those combinations. But that's a toy problem, right? 12 synapses. Does it work when you scale things up? Well, yes, it does. This is what we showed some years ago, where we actually had, here we have a, a 100 inputs uh, in the figure. There were actually 2,000 inputs in the, in the simulation. This is the, the simulation. These are 2,000 inputs with just random Poisson processes with varying things. It's just, just complete noise except that we've, we've taken a bunch of uh, 50 milliseconds of activity here and just copied it and placed the uh, uh, random intervals. And the remarkable thing is that one neuron, if it's listening to these 2,000 inputs, will, and it's just an ordinary leaky integrating fire cell, will very rapidly learn to become selective to that repeating path. So initially, here's the neuron firing spikes about 50 times in a second. Here's the, the pattern which we're going to repeat. And every time that it spikes during the pattern, it's going to selectively reinforce it, uh, synapses which are part of the pattern. Within five seconds, the system has tuned in and is, is now responding selectively to the pattern. And within a few minutes, it's now firing uh, at the beginning, it's backtracked to find the beginning of the pattern. So this is pretty amazing. This is one neuron on its own has found a repeating pattern in this incredibly you know, uh, noisy, uh, noisy background activity. Um, uh, oh, let's forget that. It turns out whether uh, with more neurons they'll tune into different different parts of the pattern, or they'll tune tune into. Um, uh, for instance, here we've got. Um, We've got three different patterns, and with three neurons, each neuron will tune into a different pattern. It's, it's, it's just a, sort of a, 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 a system that sort of learns on its own. And we've used this, this sort of thing to, in a more complicated architecture, to learn to uh, generate face selectivity. So here, what we've got is, um, these are faces from the Caltech face database, and we've got actually three types of neurons. There's red neurons, green neurons, and blue neurons. They initially have random connections. So you can see these neurons are firing, uh, these are maps of neurons, actually. They're firing it um, fairly randomly, but you can see that the, the receptive fields of these neurons are gradually sort of evolving. And, 
you know, this blue cell, for instance, is tending to fire at the bottom half of the face, and you can see why. It's, uh, its receptive field is tuning up. The red cell is now firing at the top of the face. And this green cell, is not quite sure yet, but it's, it's tuning into the eye and the nose. After this is after it's only seen about a hundred of these images, and it's already tuned in to features of faces. Nobody told it anything about faces. It's just done this spontaneously because that's what happens the most often. <coughs> so unsupervised learning. Um, that's that's with flashed images. Uh, we've done the same sort of thing with continuous uh, in input. This is Toby Del Brook has de developed a, a spiking retina. It's not like an ordinary webcam. It, each pixel fires spikes, um, which can either be black spikes uh, when the luminance drops, white spikes uh, are the ones when the luminance increases. And you can probably guess what this is, right? A highway, indeed. It's the Pasadena Freeway. <laughs> yeah, that's harder. Um, now, we took the output of this, it's, it's, it's 128 by 128 pixels with two types of cells. That makes actually 32,000 different types of neurons, if you like. And we just fed those into 60 neurons with this, this learning tool. Um, really simple learning tool, as I say. This is 10 of the neurons right at the beginning, okay? And you can see these receptive fields uh, are just noise, okay? And uh, now, I'm going to show you the first, uh, every time this flicks, this is in real time, effectively. Uh, it, every time it flicks, it's the neuron is fine and it's updating its weights, okay? So after, um, after 12 seconds, we're here. After 30 seconds, you can see that it's going darker, you're getting the weights are dropping away, except for particular areas. And here, in fact, uh, after 90 seconds, it's just been watching this, 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 spikes coming out of this, this retina. Within 90 seconds, it's, it's created neurons which are actually good at counting cars on the freeway. Um, and nobody told it what to do. It just spontaneously developed selectivity because these little packets of spikes happen to occur frequently uh, in, in combination. So all the system is doing is just learning about statistics of what, what patterns of spikes uh, occur frequently. So I was, I was talking at the break about the connectivity between neurons in E1 could be learned by this other way. You just have, you know, um, uh, 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 edges which are, uh, which are aligned, they occur more frequently, and that will, will connect up neurons and do that sort of thing, depending on experience. So this system has effectively learned to recognize cars with no instructions. So unlike the, the supervision system, which needed you know, 100 million labeled things of cars and dogs and all the rest of it. This system generates its own selectivity. And once you've got the selectivity, it's easy to label. You know, so you, the, the child sees dogs and cats wandering around, and one day you say, that's a dog and that's a cat. And that may be enough, because you already have the, the representation. Um, so, you know, if you, <laughs> this is a very toy system, but I mean, we can make, we can add more neurons, we can add more layers of processing. Done this yet, by the way, but uh, uh, we can increase the resolution. Or rather, you know, we can move up to a you know, full resolution. You just, you just need more neuro, but the, the basic processing would be the same. Um, we could use more sophisticated input processing and Mexican hat convolution and things like this. And we don't have to use vision, we can use audition, matter sensory system. In fact, you can throw everything in together, and the neurons don't care. They don't know what these neurons don't know that they're handling visual information. They can, they'll be just as happy with you know, a mixture of visual and audit auditory stuff. So you know, multi-sensory patterns will be learned as well. So maybe just uh, you know, uh, one last point is that you know, we've got this supervision. I think you know Google and, and Facebook. They're going to be providing systems which can do you know hard vision problems, um, but they can only let, they can only recognise things that they've been trained to recognise. You have to label all the data to get through. This sort of system potentially would be very different because it would be able to learn in an unsupervised way, and it will just generate selectivity of whatever happens the most. And if you trained it in a particular environment then it would generate neurons to cover the set of the things that happen. 
Um, and actually, this, this, this allows you to do interesting things like sounding an alarm if, if, if something is happening which you can't explain, which is just one last point. These, these sort of architectures can actually be built into electronics. So there are, there are various people working on memristor-based uh, architectures where each synapse is like a little, little electronic uh, resistor that you can program. So that, you know, that, this would be moving away from conventional computing rather than using a sort of a von Neumann architecture with a CPU and separate memory. This is combining everything together, processing memory. So, Hopefully, I mean, Michelle sort of uh, was talking about you know fast visual processing. I think we we now know that a feed forward pass actually can do really hard stuff. Supervision, you know, Google, uh, they, they, they can do this sort of thing. Uh, and I think we're in a position to explain how it is possible for an architecture which is just ten layers of neurons can can come up with hard uh, answers to hard problems. For in those systems, they don't have spikes, but I would argue that using spikes gives you a lot more. It makes the coding much more efficient. You don't have to send floating point numbers. It's just a wave of the, you know, which spikes fire, which neurons fire, spike first. And it's more efficient for learning, because you can use this STDP learning uh, idea for finding repeating patterns. So, I mean, uh, you know, and a few tens of presentations are enough to learn this. So, um, you know, configure all pro uh, perception for me, is very much as a question of you know how many times do you have to show faces with the eyes in the top and the mouth at the bottom for it, for the system to start learning about this. And, and I don't see any real limit to our, our ability to store new patterns like that. I think we you know potentially we we can move towards systems for computing which are very much you know related to how our own brains compute. Which I think is an interesting uh, an interesting possibility. So. Um, uh, credits. Uh, so the STDP modeling stuff, which I mentioned, Ruth and Rudy and Tim were very much involved in that. And this this other stuff, the learning of cars. This was done with some people at the, in the C CEA um, the Atomic Energy uh, Research thing in Paris, in, 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 in France. So Lydia Bichely was a student who did it. Who did, who did that one? And obviously, we're building up very much on all the insights that we've got from the sort of experimental work that, we, that Michelle was talking about earlier on. So thank you very much. types of neurons and the neurons at the end were like sort of an average face simply because you know, uh, that uh, you will pick up on the on the thing which is constant so and, and you can explain things like you know race effects you know the Caucasians are better at re recognizing European faces and Asians more Asian faces because they get more experience with it so I think um, that fits with the idea that we're, you know, neurons essentially are trying to find what doesn't change very much. That's what they do when they when they choose a particular set of weights. It's the stuff which is the most reliable. So I think you know you could probably fit that with the sort of David Marr thing of you know, what doesn't change very much when you rotate an object and, and so on. It's there because those are the things that get repeated most. So you, what you don't want is a thing which only ever occurs with a particular view. You want a thing which is robust uh, uh, as you move uh, move uh, the object and rotate it in 3D, for instance. And those are the things all you learn better than just you know, you know random patches of image, which, uh, which will probably not occur very often. Yeah, it was a really nice talk. I think it, it, it was 
long way to solving some of the questions that were asked earlier about what makes a feature and the importance of the correlational structure of the environment. Um, my question is, is where's the uh, where do you see in this type of architecture or this type of setup for extrapolation beyond the kind of set of training features that you uh, already experienced? How do you how do you generate new uh, combinations of things? Well, if I if I already had that, I wouldn't be able to go any further. I, I would only be able to um, interpret things which are either things I've already seen or things which are which are resemble. Exact matches. Uh, there's no, there's nothing clever here. So I mean, anything that you know involves, you know, sort of rotating models in your head, there's none of that. I and mean, it, it really is just view-based learning. Uh, but I think that's interesting to comment. For a, long, for a long time, people in computer vision were trying to solve how do you recognise objects by having you know 3D models that you rotate and then you match them with the input and so on. And that's what has been dropped completely. I mean, the, the, these guys from Google now they have just completely wiped the, the slate clean. I mean, nobody is going to try and do 3D uh, uh, models and rotating them now because you can do it so much simpler with just view based uh, massive training and so on. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, maybe it's discouraging because it, it, in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't look particularly clever. I mean, it's just a bunch of neurons and, so, and an STD. And that, but it does, um, it does actually deliver, I think. One of the significant factors in uh, visual perception is symmetry. And it seems like a natural perception really relies on symmetry in many ways. How would you incorporate that into your unsupervised learning? Do you have an idea about it? Um, okay, so right, uh, this, off the top of my head, we know that the left and right hemispheres have a universal connection. So an object which is symmetrical uh, will tend to work better because it, uh, it gets reinforcement from the other side. That kind of helps the symmetry for an object here, but it could help learn more efficiently objects which are symmetrical about symmetrical about vertical meridian. <laughs> you believe it? <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean symmetry is very uh, is very important to recognize the objects and then there's this amazing stuff on how you can uh, reconstruct uh, uh, the 3D shape uh, for the uh, uh, you know, like one two D view. Um, it looks very tempting. I, I wouldn't know how to do it. Any other questions? One last call. Mm -hmm. No, okay. So thank you. So much. Well, thank you.